Catholic Church, communion of sins, forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Give us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Lord, reveal your love among us. That we may know the joy of your salvation. Grant peace within and among all nations. Endow your church with faithfulness. And your servants with knowledge and true godliness. Defend, O Lord, the rights of the poor and the oppressed. That your justice may be known among all people. Lord, renew your spirit within us. That in us and through us your will may be done. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we pray, and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, for giving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except And we say together, Almighty, Son Jesus, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you. We now turn to page 80 and we say 17 together for the unity of the church. O oh God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ our only Savior, the Prince of Peace, give us grace justly to lay to our heart the great dangers we are in by our unhappy division. Let us bless the Lord. Depths of love 
that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. Dear Draw me near, near on the cross, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Inside Canon Noble Book to live with the reflection. Let me say good morning to the bishop, the chairman of the Synod, and all members of Synod. Indeed, uh, a joy to be here with you and to share, to have the opportunity to share in this sacred Synod, in this church, in the Diocese of the Windward Islands. I bring you greetings from the Diocese of Barbados, from Bishop Michael Maxwell, who's asked me to bring with me his prayers and blessing for this synod, and from the former Archbishop, Dr. John Holder. The distinct pleasure to share in the councils of this, of this diocese at this particular level, and once again to be in the very heavenly place of St. Vincent, once again. I do note the St. Vincent title by some of the representatives of Synod. By the grace of God, we are here to speak under the theme of intentional discipleship. Empowered by the Spirit, we renew transform, sustain, and proclaim. By the grace of God, we'll focus on this theme during the course of this week. I'm sort of in the tradition that was started by the bishop last evening in his very profound and substantial charge to the synod. Each day then we will sort of theologically unpack and build on the notion that empowered by the Spirit, we renew, transform, sustain, and proclaim. Today then, we sort of examine the notion of empowered by the Spirit, we renew. The overall theme for the Synod, if we are to be engaged in ministry, within the priestly service of the gospel is that we continually turn our attention to the theological notion of renewal. Renewal is indeed built into the total ministry of our church. 
My background is always to make an examination of theological themes using the spirit of the liturgy. The liturgy, of course, is something with which we are all familiar since we all engage in liturgical worship each week. And so we seek to examine what we may glean as we mine the text of our major liturgical book, the Book of Common Prayer, the Book of Common Prayer for the province of the West Indies. Indeed, as we search and as we examine more and more the notion of renewal in the Spirit. In the Caribbean, the Christian Church, and in particular the Anglican Church, has always been the backbone of society. It has been the foundation for many persons who hold office in society and have provided the deep roots for ethics, politics, economics, and the general common life of our people. In an article that I came across recently in a little magazine called Commonweal, the author made a point, citing a, a book by Tom Holland, that the Christian revolution across the eras has proved successful in remaking the Western world, as it were. Holland emphasizes that over two millennia, it has become virtually impossible to separate Christianity from our civilization. There are those who may not want to admit this. However, it is self-evident that this part of the world remains structured by the Christian outlook and informed by Christian ideas we may perhaps examine how this has been changing more and more over the last 20 to 30 years. Because, of course, over the, over the past 20 to 30 years, we have seen the most rapid development of human thought than the world perhaps had ever seen at any particular point in time. One of the things we realize as we examine modern life is that the things that we think today are particularly out of date by the time tomorrow comes. So you know, for example, that if you are holding a mobile phone in your hand or if you have it in your pocket or in your handbag, that the mobile phone you are holding today is basically that you bought last week. It's basically out of date. And I will be out of date tomorrow. And I say that to make the point as to the notion of the very rapid change that, is taken, that has taken place um, over the past 20 to 30 years. Political and civic institutions, legal systems, codes of behavior, artistic tastes, practices of everyday life, some way or another, we can say, have been influenced one way by another, either visibly or invisibly, as we say in, in church, by the Christian ideal or the Christian outlook. Certainly, Caribbean life is stamped by the formidable and inescapable influence of Christianity in this region. However saturated it may be with secular ideas and occupations, we remain inspired by Christian concepts that move our world. Ours is a wonderful world, but one in which there are many paradoxes and contradictions. However, we in the church theologically connect the dots between the spiritual and the material we seek to connect the dots between the things that are religious and the cultural and other elements within our world so that we are able to make sense of what is taking place as we worship and as we engage each other and as we engage one another in our communities. The German reformer Martin Luther was of the view that St. Paul's letter to the Romans was helpful in making the links between what seems like 
the many extremes or opposing positions that there are in the world. Luther sees in the Epistle to the Romans a summary of Pauline theology, a dramatic, hopeful witness to the power of Christ in the Christian life in spite of human frailty. For Luther, theologically, one defining aspect of the Christian life is that at one and the same time, humanity is spiritual and fleshly. The fleshly, of course, comes out in Paul's, letter to the, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians when we read that letter. Of course, we tend to read these letters chapter by chapter or verse by verse. But you have to imagine that when this letter was sent to these letters are sent to the various churches, they will read them in their entirety. And so I'd like to encourage persons, if they have time, as they have time, to sit down and read through the letter. You know, we read it in church liturgically in, in specific verses because, of course, you know, we don't want to stay in the church too long because we have to get home to do the other, thing, the other stuff we have to do. But when we... But when we get the chance to sit down and read the letter from beginning to end, to catch its full import, as it were, to sit down and read it the way in which you read a novel. And so for Luther, the defining aspect of Christian life is that we are one and the same time spiritual and fleshly or carnal. At the one and the same time, we are spiritual and Fleshly, at one and the same time, human beings tend to be good and evil, good and bad, and, you know, all of these roll together as one. The Christian, though graced by God in holy baptism and participating in the Holy Eucharist, remains in need of the grace of God in order that we may live what the Greek philosophers refer to as the good life. If we want to explore this fully, then we must examine the roots of our liturgical life and ritual prayer. One of the important aspects of a Christian prayer is summed up in the dictum Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi, translated loosely as the law of prayer is the law of belief. What this says in essence is that if we want to know what Christians believe, then we must examine the prayer text. We must examine the hymn text that we use. And this is vital for renewal. That's we, as I mentioned earlier, mind the text to, to, in order that we may plow the depth of the things that we say and sing when we are gathered together in Christ week by week. So renewal must be rooted in what we do together. One of the ways, one of the things that we do when we gather together in our assembly is that we go through together what is referred to as the penitential, a penitential rite, an order of absolution. But, and perhaps that is a good place to start. For whenever we celebrate the Eucharist and whenever we do morning prayer, there's always that notion of penance and absolution. Every time we celebrate the Eucharist, we participate in this liturgical act of penance and absolution. We do this as a Christian community, priest and congregation together. Notice I said priest and congregation. I didn't say a bishop. I don't say anything about bishop. For indeed, the priest and congregation, the, the clergy and the congregation together, we make up the people of God. In synod, for the sake of convenience, we have the house of clergy and the house of laity. But notice it said that's for the sake of convenience. But indeed, we are the church together. We are the church together. Our ancient roots together lie in what we may refer to as liturgia, or the service of God, the service to God Almighty in the world. The Anglican Church defines liturgy as 
the body of rites prescribed for public worship. The liturgical service manifests itself across the church and is the core of what it means to live a Christian life for all of us as Anglicans. For as Anglicans, we gather together in celebrating the sacred rites. As we gather together in sacred synod or engage in daily work, whatever we do, when we come together, it is to offer to God what God Almighty has given to us. The work that we do, both in the liturgical celebration or in the synod, or in daily life and work, is all done under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit, in whom we were baptized, in whom we have been strengthened by the laying on of hands, and in whom we participate, and Christ in whom we participate fully in the Holy Eucharist. And so baptism, hand laying, and Eucharist. This these give us a common heritage. There is something that we all share together. We all share this together. We have all passed through the waters of baptism. Hands have been laid on all of us. We participate joyfully in the Holy Eucharist. As we celebrate the Holy Eucharist then, one of the fascinating aspects of the liturgy is that section where it deals with the penance and absolution. Thomas Cranmer, whose name I'm sure is familiar to all of us, he summed up not only the need for daily renewal via the penitential rite, but the entire human situation. When he wrote in his early documents, and you can cite this along with me, we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And we have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And you can tell me if that does not particularly sum up the human condition. In, the, in this, in the entire church in this, we recognize that if we recognize that we are to move forward, then perhaps you must pay a bit more attention to this very short section in the entire liturgical celebration. When we assemble, we take the form of a community in order that we may celebrate the Eucharist together. Professor Kevin Irving states that the penitential rite is a communal action whereby we admit our need for God's grace through his Son at the Eucharist we celebrate. While it is, of course, personal, it is done in communion with others. The priest invites the congregation to take part in this penitential rite. This links us to our common baptism mentioned by the bishop in his charge last evening. For the penitential rite serves the purpose of placing us in the same state of grace in which baptism places us in order that we may receive the full body of the Lord. And so renewal, renewal, comes through the confession of sin. But not only sin, not only the notion of sin, We're not emphasizing the element of sinfulness so much, but rather the goodness of God. For God is gentle and full of compassion. This helps us on the path to mission to which we have been called in Christ and renewal in that mission. When Paul, the, when Paul the Apostle wanted to describe that mission in his letter to the Romans, he says to be a minister of Christ Jesus, he speaks of being a minister of Christ Jesus in the priestly service of the gospel the priestly service of the gospel. This is fascinating. This is ministry at its highest. This is ministry at its finest. Paul, coming from his Jewish tradition and background, has, this has tremendous implications for Paul's understanding of ministry. For he came from a background in which 
Only the priest entered into the Holy of Holies. Only the priest entered into the Holy of Holies. But he's looking at a ministry in which all humanity will have access to God Almighty. All humanity can enter into the Holy of Holies. And so this represents liturgy and worship in a supreme way, one with which we cannot trifle it is one that we must never take lightly. And so we, as we ponder and as we move towards that whole understanding of renewal, we have to ask ourselves if it is connected to the tinkering with rights or seeking to examine more meaningfully the depth of the rights in which we participate week by week and in some places day by day. We must discern exactly what it is that we want to communicate. The blessed apostle Peter will echo words almost similar to Paul in his letter to the Romans. Chapter 2 and verse 9. And when Peter thought of the church, the Christian gods, the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God Almighty calls us into his marvelous light by manifesting constantly his goodness towards us. It is vital, therefore, to understand and appreciate that the house of laity, the house of clergy, and the house of bishops make up the entire body of Christ. We plow the depth of sacred scripture. We discern that there can be no separation, as it were. We are called to both membership and leadership, and this is why we are here. This is one of the major reasons we have gathered together in this sacred triennial synod, in order that we can discuss and tease out each other's thoughts that we may seek the mind of God together and come up with a collective and informed response to the issues that confront us in a modern world, in a modern church, in a postmodern world. It is, this is vital since so many of the institutions on which our society have been built are now currently in crisis. The church the home, the school, all worked in, in tandem, all buttressed each other and held up by the elders in the community who kept a watchful eye over those who were in what the hymn writer calls the slippery path of youth. We are a region with amazing and creative and ambitious outlook. We have been blessed with an awesome geographical location. The goodness of God is all around us. God Almighty continues with us so that we may be able to offer to our communities that bright and sparkling light that is Christ Jesus. We pray that God Almighty will be with us in this sacred synod. We pray that as we seek to examine these things more and more, that God Almighty may show us again the deeper meaning of the, the, his goodness when we plow the depth of penance and absolution in our search for renewal, that like Thomas Cranmer, we may recognize those things that we ought to examine in order that we may search and our community forward. We give thanks to God Almighty that in the sacred liturgy, there is the essence of what it means when we talk about the renewal of the church as laity and clergy communicate together so that we may examine the various agenda, the structures that we may encourage the development of a genuine collaborative model for the church as we carry ourselves forward, as we carry forward by God, and as we seek to move our community forward, and as we seek to draw persons into the body of Christ. If renewal is to be that powerful theme espoused by all of us, then we pray that we may truly listen to each other, 
listen to each other, listen to every voice in order that this may lead not only to renewal, but also to transformation. Let us pray. Almighty God, for as much as without you, we are not able to please you. Mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, O Lord. Amen. Thank you.